Hey folks, Doug Blake with Body Design University. Welcome to another weekly study. And today we are going to, in this video, talk about chapter 12. Yes, the infamous chapter 12, where we see the postural movement and performance assessments. Uh, this is where, of course, we, uh, we have the solutions charts for the overhead squat assessment. And, you know, as is normally the case, as I look through the Facebook group and I talk to students in our exam prep course, you know, look, aside from chapter seven, which has a ton of the science and uh, the kinesiology, things like that, uh, that's challenging enough as it is. I get it. But chapter 12 and some of these later chapters are are what we call high priority chapters. So from a purely testing perspective, you know, you got to know which uh, which chapters are he more heavily represented on the NASM exam. And we know this. And in our study guide, we have it. Um, and you can figure it out if you just look at the domain sequences that that NASM has, you're going to find that uh, chapter 12 is just one of those chapters. I think it's chapter 12, 13, some of these uh, later chapters where it's talking about assessments. Uh and um, those related subjects where you're going to see a lot of test questions. I mean, look, just, just look in the group, just as a, for instance, and you'll find folks that have already taken it and passed it. They'll tell you everything is on the test. Ladies and gentlemen, this textbook, there's no area in this textbook. There's no chapter that doesn't have at least one question in it. It's just that there are higher priority cha uh, chapters where you're going to find five questions, 10 questions, maybe even 25 questions from one or two chapters. So that's why, um, as I've been looking through and talking to some students, the, this, the question has come back again on, on chapter 12 when it comes to the overhead squat assessments and trying to memorize the overactive, underactive muscles. You're going to hear this um, over and over, right? Um, sort of the general the general uh, understanding is that when folks come out of that, that test, they remember two things, overactive, underactive muscles, right? And the elements of the OPT model and how to incorporate it into the training, training program. So here in chapter 12, and I've got my, I've got my hardcover book, but I also, I also have, because some of you probably have this as well. You have your digital, uh, your digital formatted, a book as well. So again, this is chapter 12. I'm looking at it right here. Um, look, I'm going to be honest with you as, as much as I like digital content and I can use it, I, I still like to have my uh, hardcover, hard copy book with me because obviously I'm going to be reading and writing. It's just not as easy. If that's the way it is for you, then great. Um, so again, this is chapter, chapter 12. And I wanted to uh, first and foremost, help you to understand something about the overactive, underactive muscle um, scenarios and concepts. And uh, NASM does a great job with a lot of their explanations. And here's what I want you to do. This is on page 383, and it's the getting technical. And I really want you to look at this because it's actually going to be more helpful than you than you imagine. Uh, because when we when we talk about overactive and underactive muscles, the key thing to remember is that overactive and underactive refers to the muscles in relation to their antagonistic muscles. This is why we don't talk about just an overactive muscle. If a muscle is overactive, de facto, its antagonistic muscle must be underactive. Let me say that again. And by the way, this helps when you're looking at the solutions chart. Your overactive muscles, de facto, by default, if you have said or if you are told that a muscle is, quote, overactive, meaning that the, the effective neural drive to that muscle is heightened, you have to, you must, by definition, de facto, now have an underactive muscle that is its antagonist from a kinesiological perspective, right? So if the bicep flexes the elbow, its antagonistic muscle is the what? The tricep, quadriceps, hamstrings, right? Hip flexors, hip extensors, hip abductors, hip adductors. So one of the things you can keep in mind is that when you're, and, and students will comment on this, don't, don't memorize, don't do rote memorization. Well, that's not correct. 
you must memorize. Memorization is the beginning of learning. So just understand that, okay? Um, no, you have to memorize. You have to memorize definitions. You must memorize concepts. But that's not where you end it. That's where you begin. Just like with writing material down. Listen again. Memorization is the single most important thing you ever do when it comes to learning. Why? Because that's the beginning. If you don't memorize the information, if you can't memorize what the adductors at the hips are, guess what you're not going to be able to do? You're not going to be able to utilize that memorized information to answer the questions on, on the exam. I know a lot of students ask, well, are the practice exam questions similar to the actual exam? Um, some are, some are not. It just depends on where you're getting your practice exam questions from. Um, don't memorize the questions. No, 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 no. The strategy for that is you do the questions. And if you got it wrong, you need to understand why you got it wrong. That takes you back to what? The textbook. It takes you back to the material, which you did not memorize. It's because you didn't memorize the information that you were not able to access it for retrieval to answer on a test. So that's kind of an aside. Remember, learning theory is critical to uh, trying to get this stuff into your gray matter. So learning theory, there's a lot of different learning theories, by the way, just so you understand this. Um, so the memorization part of it is critical. The issue is not whether you memorize or don't memorize. The question is always, how do you memorize? How do you memorize? Because it's going to be different than the way I memorize information. This is where learning styles come in. And not everybody agrees with the whole concept of learning styles. That's irrelevant to me uh, because it, it can be a game changer for a lot of folks. Folks, it doesn't matter. Uh, but for a lot of folks, it's a game changer. Why? Because many folks have been trying to learn, right? Learn information uh, by inadequate, ineffective, inefficient memorization processes. So if you're getting frustrated, more than likely, it's because you're not learning according to the way your brain works. So in chapter 12, what I want you to do is to read this getting technical thing here, right here, right? This paragraph or right over here. Let me put my glasses on. The terms overactive, underactive are used to refer to the activity level of a muscle relative to another muscle. Stop, stop. Overactive muscles are only overactive. Why? because they have an antagonistic underactive. The underactive guy is only underactive because in conjunction there is in conjunction with it there is a overactive. And that's what that's what this if you if you look at this this figure muscle imbalance this is a really good rendition of what we're talking about. It's very simplified uh because muscles don't look like this obviously but the point is, is that what it's showing you is that this guy right here cannot be shortened or overactive without a compensatory underactive antagonist. Now, how does this help you from a memorization standpoint? If you know the muscles, if you know your basic muscles of the body, there's how many muscles are there in the body? 600 something. You don't need to memorize them all. You, you only need to know maybe 40, maybe 50, I guess, something like that. I haven't memorized all the muscles, but as long as you understand the, what the, what the muscles of the body are and what they do kinesiologically. And I've said this in other, in other uh, videos, as long as you got that, the concept of overactive and underactive is simple. If, if the um, iliopsoas, if the iliacus and the psoas muscles, which are, which are the primary, primary hip flexor muscles. So the iliopsoas muscles, just as a, for instance, if you know that they are overactive and you've already memorized, right, what the muscles are, what the major muscle groups are at the hip, and that's what you're seeing when you look at the solution chart in like the overhead squat assessment, well, you automatically know that if if the iliopsoas, which are hip flexors, are overactive, what's the underactive? Well, it's got to be the, the hip what? The hip extensors. And if you've memorized that, which is not difficult to do ladies and gentlemen it's not difficult to memorize some of this information read it rewrite it and say it out loud to yourself and just try doing that once i get people to do that that you understand and utilize that concept read it rewrite it 
and do it again and then do it again and do it again and do it again and again and again until you're dreaming about it. You can't get it out of your head. You know that the gluteus maximus is a what? It's a primary hip extensor. Your hamstrings, rectus spinae, pelvic, this, right? Your, your rectus abdominal. Once you start that process, all of a sudden you start to realize, oh, wait a minute, you automatically make that connection. And that's why reading this right here and understanding this little paragraph right here is really important. Relative muscles, muscles come basically in functional kinesiologically function functioning pairs of what we call agonists, which is the, the mover, the guy actually doing the movement, and it's antagonist, which does the opposing kinesiological movement. Muscle flexes, an antagonistic muscle extends. One muscle abducts, another muscle opposing it adducts, right? And so if you read this, muscle group muscle, not necessarily to its own, to its own normal functional capacity. That's the key is that just because the bicep feels tight doesn't mean it's overactive. It's only overactive if compared to the tricep, it has a higher neural drive than normal. And, and the tricep therefore has a reduced or diminished neural drive. If the tricep, you're never going to find this out. It's not like you're going to be doing an EKG on your muscles. If you were to, if you were to uh, check the neural drive of your tricep and it's normal, so to speak, compared to itself, then the bicep's not overactive, and then vice versa. Hope that hope that makes sense. Um, which causes must be held in a chronic state of contraction. Look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The whole concept of overactive and underactive is actually pretty important, but really uh, only when we're talking about stretching. And NASM speaks to this, right? Because the whole goal of stretching an overactive muscle and then strengthening the underactive muscle is a key element to the OPT model itself. So it is actually really important in the real world. It's one of those tools when you put this in your toolkit, this is actually a really, really helpful tool that you will take from the textbook. Because I know folks are always asking, well, am I going to use this in the real world? Mm, probably not most of it, but there's a couple of really good, like this is a great, great nugget of information. And because these guys that, that you know, that started NASM with physical therapists, they know this stuff really, really well. Okay. So um, chapter 12 is a Really, really important chapter. And just real quick, I just wanted to show you. Um, let me go to an overhead shot. Stop sharing that. Let me give you an overhead shot real quick just to give you an idea. Once again, I like the idea of using of using the book. And when you look at the book, look at all of these definitions. Folks, NASM did not give you all of these definitions for nothing. And they put them in nice little boxes here. So guess what you can do? And this is what I do. And this is what I recommend you do. Yes. And again, again, it depends on the amount of time you have to study. But you literally, if you read through the chapter, and I've just got this off to the side, but if you read through the chapter, do it once, peruse it, as we call it. Does everybody know what the word perusal means? Perusal, right? It's a quick read through. My recommendation is, is that you do a perusal. If you got the time, you do a quick perusal of the entire textbook first. If you have the time, okay, perusal means you do a quick run through, kind of get your brain um, exposed to the material, but you're not sitting and stand sitting and studying it. Okay, you're not studying it through a perusal of the material. You just kind of read through it. Um, you start to go. Th you read through. You read through. Right, and I can show you. So I would be reading through, and I'm not. I'm not using this. Okay. This is over here. I'm just going through and I read through and then I'm exposing my brain to it. If you don't have the time to do it, if you've only got a month to study or three weeks of study, then okay, you may not have to do a perusal. But once you do the perusal of the material in chapter 12, there's a couple of other things. I'm not going to go through everything with you in this video, but the one thing I definitely want you to do, okay is to learn all of these terms. You got to memorize these terms, okay? Memorize terms, okay? That's a key, that is a key 
uh, key strategies. You got to memorize terms. It's not the memorization is not the problem, folks. That's not your issue. Memorization itself is not the issue. It's the fact that you don't know how to memorize effectively for your for your brain. That's really where the problem comes in. That's why you get frustrated. Um, you can give me 100 terms with definitions and I can memorize them. This takes me a little time, but I can do it. and I don't get frustrated because all I do is look at it, read it, write it down over and over. And I know what you're saying. It's inefficient, right? It takes too much time. No, what's inefficient is when you're reading, 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 and then you start doing this, start going after 25 minutes and you're doing this and then you you realize that you just lost 20 minutes of time and now you got to go back how many of y'all do that how many of y'all find yourself having to go back and reread that's inefficient but when you're strategic then you're studying and you get the material and you read it and write it that is critical rewriting stuff and by the way don't just use a pen you don't have to use just a pen use colored write in different fonts Draw pictures, do whatever it takes. And that depends again on your on your learning style, but just keep that in mind as you're as you're going through this. So in this video, I just wanted to help you in this one point. Because again, I, I hear folks asking about particular points like the overhead squat assessment, which is in chapter 12. But but remember, that's that tip I want to give you. You got to memorize these terms, peruse the the chapter first. Um, and then understand, because I wanted to give you this information on overactive and underactive, I just wanted to hit you with this one um, uh, paragraph right here, which I think can be very helpful. So keep in mind, overactive and underactive muscles, in order to understand in the kind of the real world scenario, is that you don't have an overactive muscle unless there is a what? compensatory underactive muscle that's allowing the overactive muscle to actually have a higher or because of its higher neural drive, then that muscle compensates by reducing its neural drive. You can't have an underactive muscle. There has to be an antagonistic overactive muscle or muscle group that goes along with it. So again, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please, please let us know you can uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is very, very helpful. And if you hit the um, the bell, you can actually find out when the new information comes out. Um, also, if you have any comments that you want to make on any of the videos. And look, the best comment is, can you explain a little bit more on b -b -b this particular topic? You can post in the group and just ask the basic questions. But do me a favor. Make sure they're really specific. It's very helpful if I know that the question is in chapter five on this particular topic. And keep in mind, when in doubt, do a learning style uh, quiz or test uh, to help you understand where you may have some deficiencies and how you have to learn and memorize information. So uh, again, let us know if we can help you out. Have a great, great weekend. As always, we'll see you next week. Bye.